Finally, we're going to talk about phosphorus fertilizer management. When we're thinking about managing phosphorus and fertilizers, um, we most commonly evaluate if a soil needs fertilizer by analyzing soil tests. Um, so for Ohio, uh, the most common soil test or soil test extracted is malic 3 for phosphorus. Bray P1 has historically been used, but there was essentially a shift. Um, a few decades ago, and Malik 3 is really kind of the default uh, test, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few weeks from now. But um, the really the process is sending a sample to soil test lab. It gets mailed or dropped off. That sample is dried, it's ground, it's uh, shaken with an extract, and then it's quantified on the ICP, okay? So Malik 3 levels, um, to give you some idea of what we're talking about here, 20 to 40 part per million are tip would be kind of a recommended range. Anything over 100 would be very high, um, which not uncommon, but all, you know high. Uh, 50 part per million would be typically maybe 60 would be the absolute most you'd ever want to apply phosphorus. So um, just to give you some some idea. Uh, here's data from three sites in Ohio and Wood County at the Northwest Branch. Um, uh, in Clark County at the Western uh, Branch and then in Worcester and Wayne County. And so there's three different levels of phosphorus fertilizer. Um, a zero, a one X, which is essentially fertilizer at removal rate. That's that light blue. And then a two to three, so two to three times that removal rate is this dark blue. And so you can see trends over the last, say, 14 years here, um, or whatever it is, 13 years, uh, of different phosphorus levels that were applied in a corn soybean rotation and what's happened over time. Okay, so clearly the unfertilized levels have been dropping, and, um, you know, the 1x levels are at removal rate hold about steady maybe a little decline there depending on the site and the two to three X rates are are building okay so but let's that's a little bit more applied we'll get again into some of this practical application but let's take a step back and talk uh, really more about some of the cons maybe the, the conceptual pieces of this kind of management so one of the things that we talk when we're about fertilizer particularly phosphorus is placement of pea fertilizers. Um, and so we can apply this in a number of different places. We can do a soil applied or plant applied. Soil applied are often uh, put into a few different categories. Broadcast, which would essentially be broadcast over the surface uh, with a say like a spinner spreader or a drop spreader that's just gonna take this dry granule fertilizer and they're gonna, and it's essentially gonna broadcast it, presumably evenly across that surface. It could be left surface applied. It could be incorporated. Um, it depends on again on the management. Um, most common thing to do for phosphorus in the fall would be a uh, fall broadcast, and then not uh, not, and then not incorporate. Just leave it surface applied and and leave it. And that's um, maybe a little bit more than. Um, I don't know, I can't recall, maybe about half the acres or something. It's the majority, of, it's the, the most common practice. And there's some issues with that, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So there's also, we can band them, and this is typically a, a subsurface placement in strips. It can be surface applied, although that would be relatively uncommon. There's also starter. So that would be a subsurface placement specifically when we're planting. And this could be a you know, field crop, it could be a vegetable or a number of different um, a number of different applications for starter fertilizer. Uh, for field crops, it's very common to do say a two by two band. Um, and that would be placed two inches below and two inches to the side of the seed. And that has just been like kind of a standard for how we apply starter fertilizer. There's also a pop-up uh, fertilizer, sometimes called infurro, when the fertilizer is placed directly with the seed. And anytime we're putting fertilizer with the seed, we have to be careful about salt burn or seed damage 
either from the salt or for the ammonium. Uh, the ammonia that is in that, say, a nitrogen fertilizer source. So we can run into problems really quickly when we do that. Um, so starter fertilizer, again, is that planting. That's e either like a two-by-two two or a pop-up, and but that's really a banded kind of application that would be subsurface. Um, there's variable rate, of course. So that means that there's not a constant rate across the field, and variable rate would apply to either a broadcast or a banded or starter can apply to any of these. Um, those would all be considered soil applied fertilizers and then there's this plant applied which would be a foliar application. Okay, So those are kind of the, the broad categories of how we would place pea fertilizer. Broadcast, uh, again, application to the soil surface, you know, this is with some kind of, uh, say, a bulk tank that's driving over, and then there's a spinner that's, like, actually spitting it out and dispersing it. This would be a small operation compared to what you, you can see. Um, again, it can be incorporated. It might not be incorporated. It's the simplest, fastest, most inexpensive method to apply phosphorus, okay? Um, fall applications are typical, but some there's plenty of phosphor that's applied in the spring as well. In soils with lower P fixation rates, that is soils that are in range or um, in kind of a recommended range already, um, fixation rates will be typically low. But when we're in really low testing soils where we are suspect fix high fixation rates, this might be challenging to get meet all the crop nutrition need by broadcast. So we might want to think about a more concentrated placement via banding if we're in, a, in a, either a high fixing soil or in a soil that's very low soil testing. Okay. Uh, No-till um, can cause stratification uh, by depth and so you know in a no-till situation, a true no-till where we're not tilling for say you know many many years, decades or more um, constant application at the surface, you know, really increases the stratification, that is the concentration of nutrients in the surface, and then as you go through depth, those nutrients really diminish. So in no-till situations, you know, thinking about banding um, or some kind of subsurface placement might be um, uh, advantageous or considered better in that regard. So. Banding uh, phosphorus fertilizer, again, this two-by-two two placement, so it's uh, two inches over and two inches down. There would be a, uh, a disc opener that would place the seed and then another disc opener for the fertilizer. So that would be uh, very kind of common on a lot of um, planters that you would see around. Uh, because we're putting starter fertilizer and banding it, there's less interaction with the soil, less less um, soil volume, um, and less rates of fixation that would happen because of that. Okay, so, and then of course putting it right here as opposed to a broadcast application, when that seed starts to grow, it's going to have a really good access to a highly enriched phosphorus zone right here. So it's um can be very advantageous for plants, especially in cool or wet conditions, okay? Mm. Now starter fertilizer will nearly always uh, translate into an increase in the development of the crop. In other words, as that crop is developing, it will typically um, progress a little faster. So in the case of um, like uh, corn, for example, you it would put on um, a greater number of um, leaves quicker, and then it would go to actually flowering quicker. So it would ta the corn would tassel uh, maybe a couple of days, maybe a whole week early, relative to a, a you know a strip that would not receive starter. But that doesn't you know just because um, faster development doesn't certainly doesn't always translate into higher yields or, or better outcomes. So um, it's just, you know, that's perhaps the most consistent thing we find with abandoned or soil apply phosphorus. Okay. So advantage, uh, we can often save on fertilizer bills if we're, you know, just banding in a small band and not 
going the whole soil. So this could be better if, if you're renting ground and not um, farming, um, you know, plan on farming that or unsure if you're going to farm it, say in five years from now or whatever. Um, and it can improve yields in no-till uh, soils where soil temperatures are typically low because a lot of residue and they haven't been, um, you know, disturbed or aerated. Disadvantage is that typically uh, band application requires additional time and labor at planting for filling fertilizer boxes for, uh, you know, planters can't go as, as fast or they're, they're way down so they can, you can't often increase planter size um, proportionally if you've got heavy fertilizer boxes on it. Uh, we can't band and put close to the seed and you know that's really just like a, can often considered a one-time deal. We're not applying starter fertilizer uh, for a corn and then a soybean and then a wheat crop. It's really just for that crop. So we can't jack the rates up so high uh, that it's going to be, you know, feeding successive crops after this one. So that's one disadvantage. Whereas a broadcast application, you can apply for two, three, four years in advance. Um, and again, because of this limitation and what we're putting in a band, we might not even supply the required phosphorus for that crop in a in a single two by two placement. So it might require an additional, say, broadcast application or, or some other event of fertilizer, right? So okay, so you know, uh, imagine the same amount of fertilizer where we apply it in broadcast versus when we just band, and so obviously a lot it might be the exact same number of dots or total weight of fertilizer but just put it in a much smaller space and so that's the whole idea with banding okay we also have pop-up um, again pop-up or in furrow it's putting fertilizer directly with the seed this can be dry fertilizer it can be liquid fertilizer so for it would be most commonly MAP for phosphorus or 10340 or AAP for uh, a liquid when we do this, anytime we're putting fertilizer with seed directly, there's always a risk of seed injury, either from salt or from ammonia. And uh, that's just the reality. And so we have to be careful when we're doing this and know what we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's increasingly common, like I just mentioned, with new and larger planters that don't have fertilizer boxes uh, to just be pulling, say, a liquid tank. Um, of 10340 and then doing an in furrow application that is a startup app or a pop up application directly on that seed. Okay, and so you know it can work fine, but there's uh, it's certainly not the most ideal. And if we want to have a chance of seeing a yield response, we have much, much better chances. P studies that have evaluated this over the last, you know, say 20 years have consistently seen a better response when it's put in this uh, two by two band than when it's put in a um, in furrow or pop-up application okay strip application so uh, you know this can be um, I mean this is more like a generic thing it can be uh, narrow bands or 30 inch centers or whatever however we want to do it um, typically this might be done with some kind of strip tillage event so we're not tilling the the entire field we're just like tilling or uh, ripping say a um, kind of a, you know whatever your row spacing might be or whatever your uh, your implement might be so um, again advantages reduce contact with P and so reduce fixation um, and then we've got a larger pool of uh, nutrients uh, for direct root contact so uh, and this could be placed narrow or it could be placed deep, right? And so deep placement fertilizer, this is kind of a, a new thing that people are, are interested and excited about. Root zone banding or dual placement knife injection. So we're talking typically at least four inches, but often deeper, sometimes six or eight or even 12 inches deep. Um, and you can apply a lot of fertilizer at that depth. That might be something where you would have that um, that is geo reference, and so you've got a tractor, for example, on guidance, and we're going through and we're 
placing a lot of pea fertilizer or P and K fertilizer at depth. We essentially really minimize phosphorus uh, loss and potassium loss with that system. It does, you have to, you know, drive slower. It takes a lot of horsepower to place uh, fertilizer that deep, but people are uh, playing around with this and, and really experimenting, which is pretty interesting. So um, uh, it takes specialized equipment, slower application. It costs more to do this, but it might, you know, really work into people's setup. So whether you're growing field crops or whatever you're growing, you know, having some kind of deep placement and then putting a lot of fertilizer in the ground and then thinking about that as kind of a single application event and then you're going to plant over those strips, whether this be field crops or vegetables or fruit or whatever you're doing, um, and having that fertilizer there and, and available for years to come is, is an attractive option. Uh, variable rate application, um, you know, Again, anytime we're talking about variable rate, we're thinking about GPS um, and then using some kind of GIS tool to map and uh, monitor. Um, VRT is a common variable rate technology, so you know that would be what commonly referred to in the industry. And again, this is looking at spatial variability in a field and then making applications, uh, you know, based on that. If uh, this only works if you're soil testing on like a, a zone or grid sampling where you're we'll talk more about that later but if you're sam taking more than taking a field and subdividing into into subunits and then getting soil test information from that and then making applications based on on that soil test information so uh, good VRT variable rate technology it depends on good soil testing so that's like kind of a a requisite, a prerequisite for doing variable rate is like you need to do soil testing, breaking that field up into smaller subunits. Okay. Foliar fertilizer uh, is really not recommended for macronutrients, folks. Uh, despite what folk, despite what you hear, what people want to sell you, or may want to sell you, uh, plants have evolved to take up nutrients through the roots, right? Not through uh, full air and it, full air fertilizers make sense for very small um, quantities that especially when there's a lot of binding that happens in the soil but phosphorus is not one of these cases phosphorus should be soil applied um, full air fertilization is really only effective for small quantities of nutrients or other types of growth promoters etc cetera, etc cetera. typically not cost effective for pea Someone tries to sell you a whole thing about why you should foliar fertilize full with um, the foliar parts of the plant with phosphorus. I I would ask for data and probably um, you know be very skeptical of, of that as a recommendation. Okay, so pea fertilizer management, we really need to think about absorption precipitation reactions. Uh, how much P is getting fixed is going to determine how often we should apply it. Typically, soil texture plays into P fixation as we talked about. Higher clay soils, higher CEC soils typically have greater P fixation rates. So we might think about um, you know managing high clay soils for P fixation, um, and then P placement. You know, thinking about uh, again, this is a bit of a, of a redundant slide, but just to kind of drive on the, po the point, this idea of exposure to soil. So broadcasting, we typically get more fixation versus banding where we're going to get less fixation because we have a higher concentration of nutrients that's interacting with a smaller volume of soil. Okay, So the band application typically are going to have less, um, less P fixation in general and more overall availability. Special case scenario that we don't really think a lot about in Ohio with our soils, but is very important for a lot of parts of the world. Zinc deficiency can occur with excessive P fixation. So P phosphorus uptake inhibits or excessive phosphorus inhibits zinc uptake. Okay, so um, and when we have a lot of phosphorus fertilizer or very elevated phosphorus soil, zinc can 
um, be driven into deficiency essentially because of that, that pea fertilizer. So um, we need to be careful when we're you know managing pea and thinking about zinc. You go say to India or in you know South Asia, there's a lot Nepal, the Indo-Gangetic Plains, there's a Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of soils there that are zinc limited, and so applying phosphorus fertilizer exacerbates zinc deficiency issues that are very real and very doc, you know easy to document there. Places like Ohio, even there's a lot of zinc that's sold, a lot of zinc that's applied. It's much more difficult. We've tried to find fields that are responsive to zinc. So there's a widespread perception that you know crops need zinc. We got to fertilize with zinc. Not saying that that's never the case, but I believe that there's a lot of zinc applied that you know um, we don't really particularly need it. So, but it's good to know about uh, that this kind of interaction, this negative inhibition uh, occurs. Okay. Strategies for making pea more available. So we can think do things that would enhance mycorrhizal symbiosis. So you know, reducing tillage, having uh, lots of crops cover, really trying to encourage that is going to do us a lot of good. Growing pea efficient plants, okay, so that whether those be like cash crops or cover crops. Optimizing soil pH, of course, is a main thing. Thinking about banding or, or somehow localizing the placement of pea fertilizer. Um, combining ammonium with pea fertilizer, ammonium will, you know, with MAP and DAP and, and and um, 1034 o that ammonium acidifies that zone where the pea fertilizer is. It typically makes that fertilizer a little bit more available, that pea more available. Encouraging the cycling of organic matter, building organic matter, all these things are going to help make uh, pea more available to the crop that you're growing. Okay. And then this will transition kind of into what we get into next week, which is uh, some of Greg Labarge and water quality and talking about the phosphorus risk index with Libby Dayton. But just I'll end with some BMPs to keep phosphorus on the field. Okay, so the first set deal with rate application and timing of phosphorus fertilizer. So the first step would be, you know, uh, BMP, sorry, this is a best management practice, okay? So this is just kind of a rule of thumb that we can follow um, for keeping phosphorus on the field, uh, stopping or mitigating phosphorus loss um, to surface waters, okay? So first of all, avoid overloading soil. So if your soil doesn't need pea fertilizer or manure, don't apply it, right? So that's a, a big challenge. Um, and um, this is, you know, don't apply to fertilizer if it's greater than, these numbers are even very generous, right? So 40 Bray or 60 Malik. Um, we want to avoid winter application, so we're not going to be applying fertilizer when the ground's frozen or, uh, you know, applying manure when the ground's frozen. These things are actually now, as of a few years ago, illegal in the state of Ohio. Um, avoid surface application of manure fertilizer. So even a very light incorporation increases uh, the contact with the soil and decreases the chance for pea loss. So these are all kind of important considerations for keeping the pea that we apply on the field. And uh, in terms of like scaling up from just the pea fertilizer piece to like farm and field features, so a really important thing is trying to minimize erosion. Most phosphorus moves with soil sediment, so that's the majority of our phosphorus loss. So keeping erosion at a minimum will help a lot of things, but uh, also will help phosphorus loading into water. Keeping soil on the field equals keeping pea on the field, right? So. Slowing the movement of water. Uh, when water just flies through a field, it typically has a greater chance of um, taking phosphorus with that. So if it's uh, surface runoff or if it's going through the tile, we want to slow the movement and that will you know, often slow P loss. So we don't want it to be like a straight channel that just sheds it and it's, and it's gone, but helping that water slow slowly percolate into the soil and then you know moving along so that's a 
a lot easier said than done. It's a nice ideal, but it's it's very challenging to man manage that, okay? Know your field's risk factor. So not all fields are the same, and uh, this is a big part of the phosphorus risk index that we'll talk about next week. So different fields have different uh, innate properties for phosphorus loss. Some fields have very low risk and some fields have very high risk. So understanding that and, and managing accordingly, okay? And then last but not least, but striving to build soil quality. So we understand that when we have a better quote-unquote healthier soil with better structure, better biology, we're going to have better water quality outcomes coming off that field in general. That's very difficult to quantify, but in general terms, uh, we know that soil quality is important and is linked to water quality in general. Okay, so with that, I'll end, and um, we'll go. That will be all of the material for the week. And again, we'll start next week with um, talking about Greg Lavarge and water quality, and then moving on to Libby Dayton. Okay.